to The Storied Human. Each week, I will tell you a story, or I will talk to someone who has their own compelling story to tell. I'm a writer who loves to write, but even more, I love to hear stories. Did you know that humans have been telling each other stories since before they wrote? It is one of our most basic forms of communication. And we still love stories that are really old. There's just something wonderful for humans in stories. I hope to explore the treasures inside of our stories. Hopefully we will all connect and feel close, learn together, and just maybe start to remember who we really are. So tell me, what's your story? I'd love to hear it. Hi, this is Lynn Thompson with The Storied Human. Today, I'm really honored to have my guest, Debbie Weiss. She happens to be my insurance agent, which I didn't know when I contacted her about this interview, but it's so fun. And she also is, she's been running the Caregiver Support Squad. She provides support for caregivers because she herself is a lifelong caregiver who's who finally did learn how to take care of herself and wants to share that with others. And I think it's a wonderful mission. I can't think of anything better. And I would love for people to learn from her. She has a lot, lot to share. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for our conversation. It's just wonderful. It's it's so funny that we were connected and I didn't know it. We have a friend in common who recommended you. Um, it's just lovely to meet you. I, I think your story is really powerful. I wanted to start maybe farther back than you thought, just hear a little bit about how you were raised, like how your parents were or what it was like, how many siblings you had. I like to get a feel for where somebody comes from. Sure. Absolutely. So I'm originally from Long Island. I have one brother. He's four years younger. And as a child, I was um, timid very insecure. I was the kind of kid who, even as I was like a teenager, I wouldn't go up to a counter and order something. My brother, who was four years younger, I'd be like, Michael, go in there and get me a soda. (laughs) Um, So definitely lacked a lot of self-confidence. My parents, I mean, you know, I, I don't recall anything we were a regular middle class family my however when i was 12 my parents were separated and that was uh very traumatic for me i was always daddy's little girl kind of grew up feeling like it's dad and i and my mother and my brother um certainly that wow. wasn't intentional but it definitely was that way. And then after about a year or two that they were separated off and on, off and on, they did come back together. Oh, how nice. But I'm struck by that idea that when we're 12, especially back then, there weren't as many divorces because we're just a little bit older. Yep. I think that you don't even think that's possible, you know? And when they tell you that it's just as a little child, it's so shocking. Oh, I was so devastated. I can remember everything about it. I can remember being told. I can remember helping my father pack. Um, And I was then a vicious teenager to my mother. Oh my gosh. gosh. (laughs) There's a connection there. And I also think like you think back, that's one of the first times you learned that things can come out of the blue and squash your life, you know, like just like destroy your peace. And it's, you don't know how to handle it when you're young, but I'm so happy to hear they got back together. Well, not forever. Oh, I was going to say, did they stay together? (laughs) The story continues. (laughs) You never know what somebody has in their story. That's right. So they stayed together. I can, I can, of course, only go by how old I was, right? So I think I was probably, you know, let's say 13 or 14 when they got back together. And then I I really don't recall, and, and my mom's still alive, and I really should speak to her about this. After they got back together, you know, I was a teenager. I don't recall. There were no arguments. There were no, you know, it was insignificant kind of. Everything seemed to just be moving along fine. And then the day after I graduated from high school, my father had a massive stroke. He was just (gasps) turned 46 years old. And that changed the trajectory of all of our lives. Now, were they still together when he had the stroke? So they were together when they had, when he had the stroke. My mother was six years younger. So she was only 39 years old. And I mean, we can 
talk about the specifics, but um, my mother decided to have get a divorce. I, I think that she Whoa. just, um, you know, which I didn't understand at the time, um, but I think she wasn't willing to give up her life for him. And, and let me just say that they were separated early on because he was um, unfaithful. Okay. So there was a, a big reason. Yeah. yeah. So well, I think that, she, that whole thing is just tinged with sadness. Yeah. But what I worry about is I think she passed the torch to you. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, obviously that wasn't her intent. I don't, I, again, I can't answer for her, but that's exactly what happened because after the first couple of months after the stroke, when it became apparent that he wasn't going back to his former self, I did at that time um, become his main caregiver. And I had um, gone away to college, which was extremely difficult to leave in that situation where, you know, my mother hadn't said she wanted to get a divorce, but I could tell that she wasn't as caring maybe as I thought she should be. And since I was daddy's little girl and I felt this sense of responsibility, um, I wanted to be the one there for him. I went away to school, but I could never get acclimated because this was always on my mind. And he had some experimental surgery done to try and reconnect the part of the brain that had been um, affected. And my mom wouldn't let me come home from school. And that was super tough. And I, again, I understand what she was doing. Then I didn't, but now I do. You know, she didn't want my life to be affected because of this. You know, she wanted me to have that college experience. Um, but I, I just couldn't handle it. That's such a and mom thing. Yeah, now we it get is. it for moms. Yeah, but oh. And then um, I came home. She did let me come home after the surgery. And I'll never forget again, you know how you just picture these things. And I don't watch scary movies, but he was in Columbia Presbyterian in New York in their neurological division or whatever. And it was like this big old building with these dark hallways with these really high ceilings. And I turned the corner and there's my father sitting in a wheelchair at the end with his head wrapped in bandages. I mean, my heart crumbled into a million pieces. And that day he said to me, I want you to come home. <gasps> wow. So and, that's why you did it. Well, I, Again, I wasn't enjoying myself because I wasn't letting myself enjoy myself at school. And my mother, and again, I totally get this because I feel the same way now with my own kids. But um, my aunt, my father's sister, who I'm extremely close to, had to basically convince my mother. She's, it's not working. You know, yes. she's not going to be successful there. Let her come home. It wasn't like I was dropping out of college. I was just going to make a change, live at home and commute to a university that was close to me. And that's what I did. Wow. So you were able to be in college and not have that awful, overwhelming thing hanging over your head. You were able to be in college during the day and then, and then be with your dad. Yeah. And, and during that time, that was pretty much where my mom started to check out. So I was really even though we were all living together in the same house, I was, you know, my father needed to have his limbs moved a certain number of times a day. And I helped him take a shower, but I had to get a bathing suit on him. So I didn't see him without any clothes on. And it was, a, it, you know, it was a whole thing. So I was commuting to a university. Um, I was working part time and oh I was gosh. taking care of my dad. And um, after about a year, when I saw the experience that my friends were having away at school, I did start to think to myself, you know, um, I'm missing out. And even though I want to be there for my dad, I was starting to get a little resentful. Sounds normal to me. Yeah. You're young. Yeah. And in the end, I did transfer to yet a third school <laughs> um, as a junior. 
and I, a different school than I originally had gone to. And I did go away to school for the remaining two years. That's good. Uh, yeah. And so then you had some of that college experience yes. who took care of him while you were at that school. Well, so um, I had a, a boyfriend as a senior in high school and we were very, very close. And he also, he actually left college kind of when I did and he was great with my dad. And so my mom made a deal with him and he actually moved into my house while I was away at college for free room and board. And he was my father's caregiver. That's a lovely solution. That's wonderful. Yeah. It was awfully odd to be away at school and your boyfriend's like doing things with your family. Taking care of your dad and living <laughs> yeah. in your home. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It did work. It did. So did work. you move back home after college? So then after college, um, at that point, then I guess when I was a senior, uh, you know, I knew that they were getting divorced and my mom had been looking for a place where my dad could live. So again, remember he was only, you know, now he's 40, whatever, 50, let's say. And he didn't need a nursing home environment. He had regained the ability to walk with a four prong cane. And um, he only had the use of one arm. So back then, all of these independent living facilities that are around nowadays, they didn't exist then. There wasn't an alternative. Yeah. Not really. So where we were, which was surprising, there was nothing. So she found a place. Um, again, I was in Long Island. She found a place in New Jersey where my aunt, her sis his sister lived. And so that's where he went. And I did come home. But even though we weren't living together, people often think of caregivers only as people who are living with their caree. However, that's not the case because I once heard a definition, if you are the person worried all the time about that individual, you're the caregiver. Yeah. And, you know, I was his person. I had to be there for everything. I had to make sure his bills were paid and, you know, he had enough snacking food in his apartment and doctor's appointments and, you know, visiting and taking to holidays. And it's a lot. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and I was in my young, you know, early You're 20s. still young. Yeah, yeah. Like that's a lot on a person. Yeah. So you I, continued, did you work nearby or? I didn't work where he was. I worked where I, you know, where I was from. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just every few weeks take the trip to see him on the weekends. And um, probably, oh, well, this, this can get, this is so crazy that I could really go into the weeds with this. So I'm going to try <laughs> not to make it too, too much, but <laughs> so he finds again, he's still young. He finds this wacky woman who lives there who thinks that he has money, but he doesn't have money. <laughs> and so she convinces him to get married, even though I said, you can't get married. You can't leave this place. If you lose your spot here, we'll never get you back in. She convinces him. And he had a very small amount of money from when my mother sold the, the house, you know, our, our my childhood home that he got. And he moved out of the facility oh and in with this woman, again, still far from me, some, you know, close to where he had been. She, this was when the, the QVC and the home shopping network was like a new thing. Mm -hmm. She, they got married. She charged, she was a hoarder. She bought every day she's ordering stuff on his credit cards and any money that he had was gone. And then she was psychologically abusing him. And he would call me crying and she was crazy and we were afraid. So <laughs> long story short, I actually had to kidnap him. I had to make this whole plan 
when she was out visiting, you know, far away when we knew she wasn't going to be back, I found a facility that had now opened near me. And um, oh, I, I had a whole bunch of people helping me orchestrate this whole thing. And um, so somewhere in my mid twenties, I think that was, he actually did then move close to me. What a crazy story. It was what crazy. I mean, I had to get him divorced. Uh-huh. I had to hire an attorney. I, I mean, for goodness sake, I didn't even have a boyfriend. You weren't even but, allowed to have a youth. You know? yeah. <laughs> yep. But that makes me feel better. You got him away from her. Yes, we got him away from her. And, uh, you. and much cl- like right around the corner from me, which was actually made it so much easier for me. Good. Well, it sounds like your father really needed you and you did the right by him, but I wish that woman hadn't taken all this money. That's yeah. terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. So when did you meet your husband? Like, I'm wondering, like, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. So I met my husband. Um, I had a different career. I wasn't an insurance agent then. I was actually a CPA and um, worked for a small firm and traveled to different clients, same clients every month. And my husband had nothing to do with accounting or money. He was a salesman at um, one of the, one of my clients and that's how we met. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And how long have you been married? I've been married in May. It will be 28 years. That's fantastic. Hmm. And how many kids do you have? Do you have two? Two, two boys. Now, I know you live pretty near me. How long have you been out here in Hunterdon County? So I got the opportunity in 1995 to um, become an insurance agent. And, but the only option was to move, you know, move out of state to this other state. It was, you know, here or nothing. And my husband and I decided, you know what, we were young. We were married a little older. He was 36 and I was 30, but um, let's give it a try, right? What's the worst thing that can happen? That's great. Yep. And so we moved here in 1995. I would say it worked out. Yeah, <laughs> I would <laughs> your, say it did your, work out. This is great. We love your service. We love your, oh, thank you. love your firm. So, so you, you took a chance. It worked mm-hmm. out. You settled out here, but the caregiving continued, right? Like, and not just your dad, right? You had kids, you were busy. Yep. The caregiving continued. Your dad. Yeah. Yep. My dad, then of course I had to move my dad out here because now he was, (sighs) now he was in New York and I was in New Jersey. So we, I had to work that all out. And actually he had to move several times um, in the remainder of his life because he didn't have a lot of money and When some funds were running out, when he turned 65, I had to find, I, you know, it was a whole education about Medicaid and Medicare and social security and all of that. It's very complex. My husband had to do that for his parents. It's so complex. It's very hard. It's yeah. Very confusing and very hard to get straight answers or the whole answer. Yeah. Um, So I, I did move him several times. Yes. So we have two sons. My oldest son is going to be 21 in a few weeks. And at 15 months, he was diagnosed with developmental disabilities. And then that turned into an autistic spectrum disorder diagnosis around two and a half. And uh, when he was nine, well, when he was six, he added ADHD. When he was nine, he added depression and anxiety, talked about killing himself. And then mm. when he was about 18 or 19, he added bipolar two disorder. So um, from the minute that he was diagnosed just with developmental disabilities, I was on a mission. I was a woman on a mission always, what does he need? What's the next therapy? I don't care if I'm going to mortgage my house to the moon, which I did, where I have to drive him to. And this went on for several years, several years. So now you have that, which is, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And you still have your dad. 
Yep. And at the same time, you have as- a business, you have your home, you have your other son. Yep. <sighs> yep. Yep. So at the same time, you know, again, I, since he was so young, I, my, I had my sights set on kindergarten. You know, I have to get him to X place by kindergarten. So he looks quote unquote typical. Yeah. Of course, you know, somebody back then gave me the an advice that I always, even to this day, think about, which is I had to realize this is not a sprint. It's a marathon oh, yeah. because, you know, I was just burning myself out. And him out. You were trying to solve it. It's what we do. We try to solve it. We think if we fight hard enough as moms, we can solve it. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, and then I still had my dad at that same time. And it kind of all came to a crescendo, so to speak, when my son was, he was going into fourth grade. He just started fourth grade and he started talking about wanting to die and to kill himself. And that was kind of the same time where my dad, um, through a variety of things that had happened, we knew were was on the decline and didn't know just how much longer he had to live. So it was, and then at that point, he was in a nursing home about 20 minutes from me. So I felt very, you know, torn and, um, you know, where do I go first? Right? Who do I take care of first? And then, you know, I do still have a business and my customers are still, you know, sometimes I wouldn't be there because I'd be either with my son or with my father. And then, you know, customers would say, I tried to call you and, you know, I get it. I have a business. If I wasn't there, they didn't want to talk to anybody else. And so, you know, a lot of pressure though. Yeah. yeah. Just a really difficult life. Yeah. You feel like an octopus, everybody grabbing it. Everybody. And there's no time for you. Is this what sort of, when did it occur to you that you weren't taking care of yourself? Um, I would say that it started to occur to me when I turned 50. And at that point, my dad had passed away about a year and a half before. And um, my girlfriends convinced me to go away for my birthday with them on a girl's trip just for two nights because I couldn't even handle the fact that I was going to leave the rest of them without me. And it was truly transformative because it was honestly at 50 years old, the first time in my adult life that I thought I don't have to think about anybody else. You mean you want to know what I want to do for dinner or (laughs) what activity I want to do? Like, it was amazing. And I think that was the moment where I realized, you know, and that 50 number was, you know, I don't want to say scary because it wasn't scary, but it's just a big one. It makes us think. Yeah. I was just going to say it kind of just, it's like hit pause for a minute and say, okay. Now what? Because I'm already 50 and I want to do whatever I can to enjoy the rest of my life. And I I wasn't enjoying my life. I was always, I was a victim, you know, and I, looking back, did I enjoy being the victim? Like I, I, I've decided I don't need to psychologically, you know, analyze myself. You were, (laughs) you were a dedicated daughter and a, a dedicated mom. And I think we don't know sometimes how to, how to temper that, how to turn that down. Right. And to me, that feels normal. You're just a very dutiful person. You know, you were a dutiful daughter and a dutiful mom and nothing gets you, nothing stops you kind of, but that didn't serve you very well. I'm so glad your friends dragged you away because sometimes those moments, I mean, I feel like we all owe them because you now offer this wonderful caregiver squad, you know, care support squad. And I feel like it all came out of that. You know, it started there. Definitely. It definitely started there. I mean, I came back from that trip and I, I honestly did not just say to myself, oh, okay. So what I really need is to take care of myself. Mm -mm." I think it was subconsciously and, you know, my weight has always been an issue. So that's kind of where I started. And then, you know, I realized with my weight, it, 
can't be an all or nothing thinking. And that can really be applied to any habit, right? You know, I, to me, it was, if I'm not perfect, I'm a failure. That's so many women I know. In fact, the podcast, the podcast class I took was more about mindset and how you approach things. And I remember this hit me so hard. She said, messy and done is better than perfect, but we're not raised that way. And especially like, I feel like you and I, I mean, you're, I think you're way ahead of me, but I think we're both very conscientious daughters, right? We're the con it's in, in fact, for me, it's like a codependence kind of thing that I had to grow out of, but yeah, the perfect thing that'll get you right. It really does. And it got me my whole life with the weight thing. It's like all or nothing. I'm on, I'm off, I'm on, I'm off, up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. And I think, you know, and, and also with that, you know what, if it takes me five years, it takes me five years. Like who, who, what, what timeline am I on? You know, <clears throat> it's always, oh, I want to get thin before the summer. I want to lose weight before this wedding. And I realize, no, I want to do it to feel good. And yeah. I want to do it because I want to be around. And, and it was all mindset and it still is all mindset. And so I agree cool. a thousand percent. It doesn't matter what it is. And, and that's something that I really want to get across. And we'll talk in a bit about to other caregivers. It's all in your perspective. Yeah. It really is. If you can just shift it a little bit. Yeah. It, it really can do and take that time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what strikes me about your saying, and I can totally relate to it because, and who, what woman can't like, I want to get thin by summer. I want to get thin by this wedding. Um, but that's not self-love, right? That's not loving ourselves. That's not caring for ourselves. Loving ourselves is saying, you know, it may take a little while, but I'm going to get healthier. And I've got the long goal in mind. That's more like loving yourself and taking care of yourself and, and saying that you're worth you know, a couple of years, right? Really working on yourself. So you're at that point, you start with the weight and then what? Then I think I, I've always liked exercise, but I've, I've actually had a lot of um, surgeries. I have a lot of physical stuff. So that always, it seemed like anytime I started to make a little progress with the movement, something else happened and I need to have this hip replaced and that hip and a back and a this and a that. Oh. So that can kind of like wear on you. Um, so whenever I could, I was always with the movement piece, but then I really, you know, I did, I started listening to some podcasts all about mindset, started to just on my own, nothing formal, just really by tuning in. Yeah. Right. That I, started to make those shifts. I said to myself, okay, I never wanted to try yoga. My pain management doctor for my back for five years. Oh, yoga and swimming, yoga and swimming. I'm like, I'm not getting in a bathing suit. So just forget that right there. That's not, doesn't sound fun. And, um, I, I, I'm no, I'm not one of those yoga women, you know? And finally I had a friend who is a yoga woman And I thought, okay, let me try this. And it was horrible. I didn't know what the (laughs) hell they were saying. I couldn't do pretty much like they, people were going downward dog and they'd say, okay, to rest, going downward dog rest. This is horrible. (laughs) I can't even stay in this position, (laughs) but I gave myself grace. And I quickly realized, you know what? darn it, that darn doctor was right. And this makes my back feel good. Isn't that great? Yep. And I realized I don't have to do what they're doing. I don't have to measure myself against those things that everybody else can do that I can't do. I'm going to do what feels good for me. Again, it's not all or nothing. That's so great. Yep. And this friend, one day she came into something, a meeting or something, and she said, oh, yeah, I'm going to this 530 yoga class. And I was like a little bit sarcastic and thought, to my, you know, I'm thinking 530 p.m. I can't make it to a class. You know, I don't get home from work. And I said, oh, and she doesn't work, but she's a caregiver. And I said, oh, so that she works. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Big, she has an adult daughter who requires full-time caregiving. She works Aww. more than me. Aww. And um, 
but she knows she's a good example for self-care. And I, so I said, oh, must, you know, must be nice to be able to do that. And she said, <laughs> you can do it too. It's 5.30 a.m. And I'm I go, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought to myself, you know what? She's right. If she can do it, why the heck can't I? And for about a year, pre-pandemic, I was taking a 5.30 a.m. class that I physically went to, but luckily it's right around the corner from my house, three days a week. There was only three or four of us, same teacher. We developed such a nice community, a wonderful relationship. And um, when the pandemic hit and that ended, that was really tough because yeah. it had turned into so much more than just the yoga, Isn't you know, that lovely. Yeah. That's yep. so good that you did that for yourself. Yep. So I did that. And then I've added meditation. I've added journaling, um, you know, being open to different, trying different things. You know, I'm a scaredy cat. So I would always be, um, like I said, I was timid. So I, didn't want to yeah. put myself out there to embarrass yeah. myself. I feel but the same. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of like everything else. Like I was so embarrassed that day in yoga and for many more days embarrassed. But you know what? If I hadn't done it, I wouldn't have discovered something that's really made a difference in that how it really feel. works for you. But what I'm struck with is that you kept going. Even though you were embarrassed, you went to the next class and the next class. So some part of you wanted to feel better. Some part of you wanted to keep you know, to change up your pattern, like not be afraid, not stop just because you couldn't do what the others were doing. And that's a very powerful when we change like that, because it means some part of you really wants to feel better. Oh, mind and body, you know, exactly, exactly. And you know, the funny thing is, even now, so I'm hoping, it's a long story, but hoping to be able, I'm scheduled to go away for two nights, Wednesday and Thursday this week Ooh. to a spa. <laughs> but it's not just, a, it's a spa with a lot of exercise classes. Nice. And when I look at the schedule, I have to tell you, the thing that still crossed my mind is, I can't go into that yoga class. Oh. <laughs> so it's still there, but, I've still all, there. but I'm going to go. But it's but, still there. You know, I've done some yoga and I find... Well, I, first of all, I found the teacher makes a huge difference, which really surprised me. I didn't understand like huge difference. Yes. But also that they're very accepting, you know, no matter where you're at, they're very kind and accepting. So it doesn't matter how far ahead they are of you. Also this, I have to return to this all or nothing because that's what they call in AA, they call it stinking thinking. And you don't have to have an alcoholic person in your family to have that, you know, to have that part of your makeup, because I think it's sort of there's a lot of theories that it's even out there in our society that we're very codependent as yep. a society. And <clears throat> it's really damaging to think that way. And I, I grew up that way. It's all or nothing. It's like, Oh, it didn't work. That's it. I'm not going to do it. Exactly. You know? Oh, he didn't like me the first time. That's it. We're not going to, you know, it's just this kind of, it closes doors. So I'm very struck by the fact that you learned how not to do that anymore. And I feel like I've learned that too. And I wanted to ask you, do you feel like I have seen people who they raised their children to 18, especially like not so much now, but in the day, back in the day, yeah. and then they kick them out of the house or, or it's like all or nothing. It's like, oh, you're on your own now. And I feel like it's a transition. And I said to my son, I see it as a transition. As long as you're making progress and you're getting towards the goal of having your own life, that's what I want to see. And I began to apply that everywhere. So I feel like you did that for yourself. You said, well, it's a transition. I'm going to be better at yoga next year. I'm going to transition to yoga, right? And it's so much more natural and so much kinder to yourself. So when did you start the caregiver support squad? So um, I started it uh, about four or five months ago now. Oh, cool. I think I realized so my husband is now also disabled so even though my dad's uh oh my 10 years since he passed away but my husband actually these last few months has been more of a concern um so and my and my son is still home and not 
doing Stop anything. Me. Yeah. So the two of them are home. And um, I kind of, through speaking to different people, realized that I had something that could help. I had information or a story that could help other caregivers. And I, I've never seen that. You know, people, and I don't like when people say, oh, you're so strong. Well, I mean, I, my feeling is anybody would do the same thing. I don't think that I'm anything. I still, and I'm not saying I'm special because I'm not. I just feel like we do what we have to do in life. You didn't ask for any of these things, but we just, you do it. And I, you know, if I was going to walk around miserable all the time, there's, oh, I don't even know how you get out of bed and every morning. Well, what choice do I have? You know, other people are depending on me. You just have to put one foot in front of the other. And then I had this moment where I realized, well, not everybody can easily do that. Not that I easily do it every day. And I realized that, you know, I can hopefully share a few of the things that I've learned and something, not everything. And I'm not saying, oh, so you should do yoga and you should meditate. No, you should do what works for you. Find your thing, right. Exactly. But you have to realize that you're important. And as caregivers, we put ourselves last. Yeah. And as all women, the time. Yeah. and as women, absolutely. And look, there's a time in a caregiver journey. You can't be first, right? right. When somebody's in crisis, you know, you're not worried about your yoga class. I get right. that. And that's completely different story, but, but kind of when you're in it for the long haul like this, yeah. You have to put yourself first because well, you owe it to them. You owe it to yourself, right? Yes. Like they say, put that mask on you first in the uh, in the airplane. Yep. Because you're not going to have anything left for them. I think you are strong. Honestly, you handled, but I also think you had a lot of years to practice this. And I think that's what we're all benefiting from when we talk to you. Because you know how to do it and you know, you know how not to do it. I agree. Uh, uh, it is a lot of years of practice because honestly, if you could, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, when I was taking a shower, if I think about the person that I was, and I think that we can all say this, if you had told anybody in my life, looking at that girl at 17, as to where I am now, 40 plus years later, no way they would have bet their life. There is no way that she's going to become this. But we each learn with every challenge, right? So at first, you know, yeah, all you want to do is hide under the covers and why me? But then, you know, you survive something. And then the next one and the next one. And so each time that you're faced with that, you're better able to handle it because you've practiced. It's wonderful. I think people need to give themselves credit too. They don't. I think the, I see a problem with just isolating yourself when you're, when you're, especially when you're living close to someone that you're caregiving for, or you live with them, it just becomes all about them, you know, and your world gets smaller, you're isolated. Maybe you're just not seeing your life in a realistic way, you know, that you still have choices. Like you were saying, there's always choices and a, and a way to look at things. I would love to hear more about that. Like your perspective. Yeah. I mean, I think um, something that I read recently said, this is my one and only life. Okay. And that really connects with me that I, I think back to that all the time. This is my life. Yes, I choose to take care of my, now my husband and my son. Absolutely. However, it doesn't have to all be about that. Yes. I don't want to look back right on my life and say, I never did this. I was afraid to. I never, you know. This is my one and only life. Yeah. That's and so why don't I deserve to have part you of, you're right. We all yeah. do. We all I do. love that. And you know, you're reminding me of that study they did. They said people on their deathbed, they, they don't miss things. They don't regret things they did. They, they regret things they didn't do. Exactly. So we need to learn from that. And you're right. It's, it's your life. You're one and only, 
also part of this whole podcast, part of my reason is I love when people have a story they can share and we can learn from your story. But I also like when we talk about coming into our own, you have a real coming into your own story because you went from a timid, scared girl yep. to someone who's really reaching out to others. And I think that is very powerful. And here's why I think that I think that we all have, I'm not the only one. We all say it. We all have unique gifts, you know, whether you're spiritual or religious or whatever, God or the universe or whatever in, in gave you gifts. You're the only one. You're, you're it. Nobody's like you. So if you, like, I always like to say that Christian song, hide it under a bushel. If you hide your light under a bushel, then you're not honoring who created you. You're not honoring who you were supposed to be. You know, you're saying, well, I'm not going to share, you know, and that's not right. It's better that we could be more fully who we are. And that's like a big push for my podcast is I want us all to learn how to be more fully who we are because we all have something, you know, I think that you found your something like you just have this wonderful ability to share what you've learned. And to me, that just touches my heart because you went through so much and what you see is I can share that and help others not go through maybe as much. So to me, that's golden. I just love that. Well, thank you. And, and honestly, since I've started and um, right now I have a free Facebook group, free Facebook community of caregivers. And, and tell when, us the name again. So we get it on re the recording. Uh, so the name of my website is the caregiver support squad.com. Mm -hmm. And on there, there's a link to the Facebook group. It has a little bit of a different name. So I don't, it's a little confusing. So that's, okay, the, best, that's the best place. That's, so that's where we start, right? That's where we start. But in the group, when I post things and somebody writes, actually it happened today. Somebody wrote, I really needed to see that today. Or I thought I was the only one who felt this way. I honestly could cry. Oh, yes. You know, there's something sacred about that. It's like a ministry. It's like God's work because you're connecting with people that you don't even know and you're giving them hope and you're helping just hold them up. You're holding their hand virtually. That's such a beautiful thing. And to get feedback like that, that's oh, wonderful. It's I've seen some of your posts. They're very lively. I really enjoy them. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I try to mix it up a little bit. You know, nobody wants <laughs> I, I, I am an upbeat be, person. So you, you get to be creative. I love that part of it. So tell me some of the things that you do talk about on, on your group or some of the things that you share. Um, well, today I, or yesterday I wrote, what's the one question you don't like to be asked? Ooh. Because as a <laughs> caregiver, you know, look, we all do this, right? You have to say, how are you? How's your mother? How's your, you know, this is what we do politely. And sometimes in your head, when someone's asking that you want, and I've had this so many times, I want to say, you really want to know how it is? <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. Uh, they don't, they don't really want to know. Most people don't. Yeah. So the funny thing is actually, so through this whole social media thing, you know, my extended family of course, they know the situation, but until you're in it, you don't know it. And I'm sometimes posting vulnerable videos at a point where something's happened in my house or it's just not a good moment. And I post these videos and all of a sudden I'm getting texts from all these people. Are you okay? I saw your video. So I'm like, it's a regular Tuesday. This is, this is just my, life. my yeah. reality. No, but how wonderful is that, that you're sharing the bad stuff too? Like you're sharing your real life so that everyone else who's struggling that way too can see, oh yeah, she goes through that too. But it's interesting that your family says, oh my goodness. You know, it's like, it's like, I've had a little bit of that with some of, it's so funny. I just said to someone, I never think of myself as someone who's been ill or had a lot of illness, but I have, I just don't think of myself that way. And I think you're the same way. And I just kind of played it down, you know, and I remember um, I had breast cancer three years ago and it was not bad. They found it really early. I only needed radiation. And I Excellent. almost felt like, you know, I don't need meals. I'm not getting chemo. Please don't make a big deal. But 
I kind of overdid it and I didn't share enough. And people were like, you have breast cancer. Like they just started doing the same kind of thing. And I'm like, well, this is just, you know, it's okay. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's yeah. like the end of the yeah. world. Yeah. It's okay. You know, radiation yeah. takes two minutes. Like I just, I think radiation is such a scary word. It is. And it's really nothing. I've got to tell you, it is nothing. It's nothing like chemo. These people who do chemo, that's like a whole other ball game. Absolutely. But it is funny that you reveal a little more and some of your family members or your friends are like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, I started to tell them, don't text me every time I post something. I'm fine. You'll know when I'm not fine. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't realize this is my everyday. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Uh, but that's good for them to sort of, you know, it's just, again, when we hide stuff, right. It doesn't help anybody, right. It doesn't help us. No. Nope. And it certainly doesn't help them understand. And when we hide stuff, we separate ourselves from others. We were talking about this on another podcast, like shame and what it does to us. There's shame like attached to so many things. Oh, well, you know? I mean, mental look, illness. I, I was just going to say it's that my son that and way. my husband, yeah. my son and my husband suffer from mental illness. It is, um, and I've, ha- you know, until them, I had no experience. It is just, uh, you see the reality. It's awful. It's you, awful. You should probably listen this Monday. I'm, I'm dropping a, um, interview with my ex sister-in-law. Okay. And she's a retired comedian and she's had a really interesting life. She actually ran a repo company. Like she wow. went and repoed people's cars, <laughs> but she's, she was diagnosed with bipolar in her late twenties. So she's now, um, I think she's around 60 and she's lived her whole adult life with this disease. And she talks so honestly about it and so practically. And she just tells people like, I love her analogy. She said, somebody said to her one time, cause she sometimes had outbursts, you yep. know? Yes, I know. <laughs> and they said, um, well, you just have to stop doing that. Yeah. And she said, if I was blind, <laughs> it's like, would you tell me to start seeing? You just have to see. And they were like, well, no, of course not. She goes, it's the same thing. And then other people just expect sort of in this culture of seeing those advertisements and you, you take this medicine and you'll be better, but real life doesn't always work like that. And she talks very honestly about, do you think your diabetes is going to go away? No, my bipolar is never going to go away. I have to manage it. I have to learn how to, the the medicine doesn't cure me. Mm -mm. And so I just thought that was so good. I wish we saw more of that where people, it's just like having a physical problem. We have Absolutely. to get better about it. We have to get better about it. But it's invisible because it is. People don't see it, right? They can usually see most other they do. illnesses. And you know, I, I'm I'm hopeful that we're starting starting to lift the veil on it. It is because, a little better. I, yeah. I notice people are a little more comfortable, and that's nice. I have this in my family. My grandma was a schizophrenic. She mm. was diagnosed schizophrenic, and back then they didn't really have a lot of choices. No. They had they had a drug that like zonked you out. And usually they put you, if you got bad, they put you in a mental hospital. Yep. So she was in a mental hospital for six years um, when my mom was a child. And it just gave me this sensitivity to, I would just always visit someone if they had to go to a mental hospital. It just gave me like this sensitivity to it. And my mother had compassion, like, and became a therapist in her later life because I just, you know, I think it's just really sad. I think of my grandma. I, I know she painted, she wrote, she wrote poems. And I just think that we, I think sometimes what we could have seen, you know, and what so many people could do if they could learn to manage, you know, if we could find a way to help them. So to me, it's really personal. Yeah, it it really is. It's super personal. And I do suffer from mild depression and I try to talk about that. Yep. I try to normalize it and I try to encourage people to go to therapy. I'm like little miss therapy. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> like, I think people get tired of hearing it, but it's helped me so much. And pretty much everybody can benefit, right? I know at different times in our lives yeah. or all the time. I have, I have, um, been in therapy off and on different times. A lot of times I'm not because depending on what the situation is, it could be expensive and everybody right. else needed it more than right. I did. So that <laughs> was my choice, but um, yeah, it, everybody can, can definitely yeah. benefit, but, but 
what you just said about your sister-in-law and the outbursts, you know, when my son was young and I, I can't let my mother or my brother listen to this, but <laughs> they don't live close. And so they weren't, you know, they didn't know my children intimately in that way, other than a few times a year. And when my son would have outbursts and they would think it was the way I was raising him. I hate that. Yep. And I have another son who's 21 months older, younger. He didn't have those outbursts. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, and, and we would kind of butt heads because they would say, you make everything about his diagnosis. And I would say, you don't give enough credit and understand his diagnosis. And as a caregiver, um, and that is something that I have talked about in the Facebook group, because there's nothing worse than not getting support from your family members. And that's one kind of support, right? But then there's that other kind of support where you have an older parent and your siblings want nothing to do with helping, right? And it's all on you. That's, you know, that's a different type of support. That's a typical situation. I keep hearing about that. Yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot for people to learn and, about and, and get better at because it's hard enough without the lack of support. I mean, that's just really hard. Yep. Some people don't understand, you know, they just don't. So I love that you've reached out in this way and that you're turning maybe some of your harder times of your life into something good for others. And you seem to have gotten a great response. Yeah, I'm very excited. I, I mean, I have to say. I'm always like, oh my goodness, somebody else, somebody else joined our Facebook group. Yay. And And I love to watch how they support each other too. You know, isn't that great? You created this community and I love how excited you get when you talk about it. That's your sign that you're supposed to be doing it because it, it lights you up, right? You enjoy it. Oh my goodness. I, I mean, I actually just took a walk with a woman this morning who's local, but didn't know, she didn't know that I was such a caregiver, but she saw it online and she's a caregiver to her husband. And she said to me, I don't understand what you're telling me. Like, how do you possibly have time to do this? And, you know, I sometimes I do want to pull my hair out, but it is so fulfilling and it does not feel like a burden or work or it just feels great. And like you said, that's, that's, you know, it's therapeutic. I'm still on, uh, look, I'm still on the caregiver self-care journey. It's, you're never get there, right? I'm always evolving and and always having things that I can improve. And it helps me as well. I think it's great because I, I do talk about a time in my life where I really, I was struggling with some health things. They weren't diagnosed. I was going through symptoms and I didn't want to see people. I had Lyme disease that was really bad. And then I ended up with Hashimoto's and my thyroid. And it's difficult when they don't diagnose you right away and you're struggling. So I, I kind of hid, I hid from people. Yep. And that's common. And even when I got better, I just, I guess I was just protecting myself, you know, and I was hiding, but this feels much nicer, like reaching out to people and hearing people like you and just I feel the same way. It's not like work at all. I work full time, but this is my fun thing. And it's so good for me. And it's so good for what I'm trying to say is just so much better being connected to people. Exactly. And I had what made you you be able to break out of that cycle. I don't know. I was trying to think of that the other day because um, I mean, not to belabor the point, but I do have mild PTSD because I was mugged years ago at gunpoint and I never really dealt with it. And I never, you know how we are. Like, I was just like, well, you know, now it's time to get past that. Yeah. Just bury it. Right. But it came out in a psychological test that I took years later. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I had it. So 25% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer end up with PTSD because it's just kind of, you know, a shock and you weren't expecting it and you don't know how to deal with it. So that, that happened to me. It happened to me and it was mild. And I, went about my life, but I began to notice one day I was sitting in the living room and I was having these thoughts like, yeah, but I don't want to go outside. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go there. It was just this fear. It wasn't big, but I wish more people would think about 
these kinds of things. Like I was able to think about it because I've had therapy and I was aware of it. And I, I'm not sure how I got past it. I guess I'm trying to think of the moment when I got past it. Maybe it's just a couple years, you know, it's been like, it's been three years. And I think that was like really important. The three years just seemed to do it. Like I, I felt more like myself. I, we were coming out of the pandemic a little bit and um, I started to be more active. I started to um, enjoy work more. I got a, a job that I really liked and it kind of came together. And, but I'd tell people, I still don't know how or why I clicked on this podcast class. <laughs> I don't, I don't consciously remember how I, I just remember seeing something and saying to myself, that looks interesting and clicking on it. And before I knew it, I was in this five day intensive free class where I just fell in love with Kathy Heller. She's a really famous, very successful podcaster. And I, I was like, how did I end up be getting her time? You know, this is great. And then I signed up for the class, which was more intensive. I don't know. These things just, they lead you along, right? You just, you take a leap, right? You take a leap. Absolutely. That's, you know, something similar happened to me to get me to the caregiver support squad. But how you said how you got out of it, I think that that's what people don't um, realize with that all or nothing thinking. It's such small steps. It was a transition, such right? A big right. thing, right? That's I so mean, good. Maybe you went outside or you did something one time and you were like, oh, okay. And again, you might not have consciously planned it, but each little teeny success. I mean, I'm I'm actually trying to do it now back with my um, nutrition situation. And it's like, okay, it this is all I'm going to commit to, this little thing. And sometimes you feel like, what's that going to do? But then, I mean, that's what kind of got me where I am today. If I didn't start with one small step and here it is eight years later, well, those small steps really do start to add up. And once you have very teeny successes, it makes you say, oh, okay. I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I can that's do a this. Stepping stone. Yeah. I think that's what I did. I also started like being with, in nature more. Yeah. Remembering how much I love to, I have woods behind my house and I would go outside and with my bare feet, I would step on the earth and I would meditate and I would send love to mother earth. I do tell people that I know it sounds weird, but I just started to feel more connected to like the spirit of the earth and the woods in a way that I always have my whole life. But this became very obvious to me, you know, and I I think that's very healing. Oh my gosh. And I, I think Facebook healed me. And that sounds crazy because people probably thought I was spending too much time on Facebook, but I began to connect with positive people. And I, I gravitated to them and I began to share like on purpose, much more uplifting messages. And I lived in that space for a long time. And I think that's also what healed me because people, if I took time off, people would say, oh, we really miss your posts. Uh And I think all of that was leading to this where I just feel more positive and I feel you know ready to really step out and, and do something different, but you're so right. It's so incremental. It's so little. And we are so bad to ourselves when we go, nope, you can't do this. And we were taught that as children, maybe like, and I think it's a nice thing. Our parents are trying to protect us, you know, from, from failure or falling on our face, but that's what I was taught. It was like, we were told stories like, oh, remember uncle Al, he started a business. You don't want to do that. He lost his shirt. Yep. Like those were stories that were told. And I know it was well-meaning. They wanted to protect us, but that's not how real life works. Real life works is you fail and you you pivot and you fail and you pivot and you you get along the way, you get where you want to go. Exactly. Something yeah. I heard this morning uh, on a podcast, and I, I'm not going to probably, I can't articulate it exactly, but it was basically that progress gives you pleasure. You oh, don't I realize I love how much happiness you get from watching yourself progress. Oh, that's so, so good. You might be thinking, oh, I can't do X or um, I don't want to, let's just say, I, I don't know. I don't want to keep using food. So like, you know, uh, with it, with somebody who wants to stop a drinking habit or smoking, you know, I need that cigarette because I need that pleasure in the moment. But really, in the end, 
you're going to get more pleasure out of the fact that you delayed that cigarette two hours. And that you conquered you know I mean? it. Yeah. That you conquered each little. Yeah. That's yep. so true. You know what else? We weren't made, like I said, we weren't made to hide. We weren't made to, to, to be, um, not moving, right? We weren't made to be not progressing. Right. That's not what we were made for. There's that beautiful quotation about the ship. A ship can do fine in the harbor, but that's not what ships are made for. And that was very powerful to me because I love the ocean and I love ships. And just the idea that, you know, you're built for sailing. What right. are you doing in the harbor? I just love that idea. That is and great. I love, I I love that, that idea too, that progress that makes you happy. And, and Kathy Heller had another saying where she said, um, how did she say it? She said, courage, courage gives you confidence. You don't have confidence first. You step out on courage and then you get confident because you progressed and you feel like, Hey, I can do this. So we got it kind of backwards. I think the way we were raised, it's like, you have to have all your ducks in a row before you start anything. And, that, and how often does that tell people like, Oh, well, I can't do this. Cause I don't have enough money to start a business or I don't have this or that, or I don't have all these things in a row, but that's not necessary. I mean, I have nothing in a row. I just, I just have have zoom (laughs) and some nice people to talk to. I don't, you know, I'm just enjoying myself. Exactly. That is so, so true is you just do it. It's like Nike. I hate to say it, but it is true. It's just, you're not, you're not progressing if you're always comfortable. Yes. And, and and I think, oh, that's really good. That, that resonated with me at my day job, you know, especially because I'm self-employed. So nobody's on me saying you should do this, this, and this, they suggest it, but it's not really the same. I'll just go, I'll do this. I'm comfortable with this. Why, why stretch myself? This is fine. Finds a word I hate. I'm known for fine. Anytime I say this is fine, everyone knows, oh, that can't be good. It's not fine. <laughs> it's, it, well, I mean, it, it's just okay. And yeah. So, and I realized, yeah, you know what? I'm moving along. Yes, I go about my days and I go about my life and I'm doing, checking the boxes, paying the bills, working, all that stuff. Is that what I want? Uh, good question. It, you know, again, always thinking, because this does resonate with me, looking back, am I going to say, I basically survived. I survived through my life. I didn't thrive. I just, I made it through. That's what, that's not what anyone of us wants. We just have to be brave enough to do it. Do whatever it is for you. And sometimes the bravery is, is barely there, but you got to do it anyway. And then you get brave, which is so cool. Like, it's just the movement, the action, like you said, progress. It makes you happy. I love that. I love that idea. I do too. So somehow we found it. We found these answers for ourselves and we're moving forward. And I think you're helping a lot of people. So I love that. Well, thank you. And nothing makes you feel better than helping people. Really. That's the one thing. I love talking to you. You too. Oh my gosh. We could talk for hours. I know we could. I have to, I have to (laughs) shut it off like artificially. (laughs) But thank you for sharing so much with us. And I know people will be encouraged and they'll check out caregiversupportsquad.com and they'll learn. They'll learn from hearing you on my podcast, but they'll also come and and learn from your support group, which I think is fantastic. Well, thank you. Nothing, like I said, nothing makes me happier to be able to help others. and, And maybe they don't have to quote unquote suffer as long as I did until I, you know, So uh, it doesn't have to be this way. I love that. I believe that with all my heart. I believe we do not have to go through something to learn. We can learn from someone else. And I think that's being, I think that's what being human is. We connect with each other and share and tell our stories. Stories are powerful. Complete. Oh, sorry. And he waited till the end. to He did wait until the end. He's He's like, interview's over. (laughs) (laughs) One more thing, because again, this woman that I listen to on podcast who's excellent and, and she always says, think about what story you're telling yourself because we tell ourselves our story, right? I can't this because like you said, I don't have enough money. I don't know what I'm doing. How am I going to start a podcast? And then you back away. 
You're the one telling yourself that story and you can change that story. You are singing my song, girl. I, that's another like whole part of the, the storied human is that we, we try to talk about what stories are you telling yourself? And maybe some of them are old. They were told maybe to you by your family and maybe they don't fit anymore, you know? And I think maybe my, my mother's story was she was a martyr you're just a martyr and you take care of everyone. And that's, that's your identity. And she reached a point where she was like, no, I'm not, you know, and that's really powerful. And I told myself the story, like, you don't need to risk that. You don't want to, you know, I was afraid for a long time and I, I rewrote that story. So yeah, you're exactly right. I love that. And um, when I started this podcast, I found out there's like a whole branch of psychology, like a discipline within psychology called narrative psychology. And therapists are using stories and the stories that people tell about themselves. So you're right on, you're like right on, got your finger on the pulse. (laughs) It's very powerful stuff. So I thank you so much. I love talking to you. You Thank you for your time and have a great day. You too, Lynn. Take care. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'd like to say a special thank you to Debbie Weiss for sharing just so much about her life and and what led her to this place where she's reaching out to caregivers and, and really helping them using what she's learned and what could be better than that. So make sure you check out caregiversupportsquad.com. And thank you for listening to The Storied Human and take care. And now enjoy a few more bars of my new intro and outro song written by my son, Brendan Talion. I love that Brazilian feel. And I really like having his original music on my show. So enjoy.